It is now time for question period. The member from Lamp uh, Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question uh, this morning is to the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Minister, yesterday we talked about how in the last 15 months the Fairness Commissioner has expensed over $3,400 in limousine rides, $3.41 for airplane headphones, and even $43.35 for a sightseeing tour in Finland, all to Ontario's taxpayers. Yesterday, you also refused to answer a simple question, and that was if you agreed with these types of expenses and entitlements. So, Minister, I'm going to ask you again. Has your office ordered the Fairness Commissioner to repay these unfair expenses? And if so, how much has the Fairness Commissioner paid back? Yep. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member office for his question. Speaker, our government has expense guidelines in place. They are very clear. We expect them to be respected by all public officials at all levels of government. The Fairness Commissioner is required to follow the guidelines of the OPS Travel Meal and Hospitality Expenses Directive. I understand that the documents disclosed to the PC include expenses submitted to ministry officials not necessary approved expenses. It is also my understanding that while expenses were paid and other withdrawn, the Minister of Citizenship Immigration is currently reviewing all the Ontario Fairness Answer. Commission's expenses. Speaker, when this review is complete, I plan to release all expenses online to the public. Can Thank you, Speaker. Well, Minister, uh, yesterday your office stated that the Fairness Commissioner had withdrawn or paid back the unfair expenses, but according to an email dated January 2014, your deputy had approved all expenses submitted except for $18.92 worth of meal claims. That means the limo rides were approved and the sightseeing tour was approved. Minister, I believe taxpayers have a right to know that your ministry paid over $20,000 in expenses in the last 15 months for what is described as a part-time job that already pays $1,700 per week. Minister, there is a simple solution. Will you immediately order the Fairness Commissioner to begin posting her expenses online for all people in the province of Ontario to see? Question, thank you. Minister? Did you not hear? <laughs> Speaker, thank you very much for the question. I wish the member opposite kind of like listening to my uh, responses. Uh, speaker, I have said uh, I have instructed my ministry to start examining all the Ontario Fairness Commissioner's expenses. When, when the review is completed, of, uh, I plan, I really plan to release uh, publicly and it will be posted online. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and back to the Minister. Minister, Ontario's current Fairness Commissioner is the first and only Fairness Commissioner that Ontario has ever had. She was appointed by your predecessor, the MPP from Eglinton Lawrence, in exchange for giving up her federal seat to failed Liberal leader Michael Ignatia. And, Minister, According to her website, the Fairness Commissioner presides over 13 senior staffers, one of whom is a close relative of the person who appointed her. Minister, do you think it is fair for government appointees like the Fairness Commissioner to hire and employ relatives of the very person who appointed them? Minister. Speaker, again, thank you very much for the for the question, Speaker, our government has always and will always be committed to openness and transparency and accountability. This is why we have brought forward Bill No. 8, Speaker, the Accountability Act, which is currently before the House. The Act will require all MPPs and senior executives in all agencies to post their expenses online, including the Fairness Commissioner. Bill No. 8 proposes to amend the Public Sector Expenses Review Act to provide the Integrity Commissioner with the ability to review executive expenses. Speaker, the scope of the Integrity Commission's review 
will expand to all 197 Answer. classified agencies, including the OFC. Speaker, I'm sure that the member opposite will urge his members to pass the act. Thank you, Speaker. New questions, the member from Bruce Gray also. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, we showed that despite your Deputy Premier's denial that she had any knowledge of the problems at Orange prior to December 2011, an email from officials in her own office indicated otherwise. A document entitled, and I quote, confidential to the minister, dated April 7, 2010, reads, and again, I quote, Orange has advised the ministry that they have embarked upon a number of initiatives that were not contemplated in the original performance agreement. That's another one of the red flags that the committee was referring to in their report. Premier, are you personally satisfied that your Deputy Premier knew nothing about the problems at Orange before December 2011? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, uh, I know that the uh, member opposite is aware that um, there were many changes made at uh, Orange because the uh, former yeah, Minister of Health yeah, knew that there before. were changes that needed to be made, and she made those changes, Mr. Speaker. Um, a new CEO, uh, a new board of directors, new senior management team, um, and in fact, as I have said, it was exactly the Deputy Premier in her role then as Minister of Health and Long-Term Care who made those changes. Mr. Speaker. So, when, when our government learned of the issues at Orange, action was taken, Mr. Speaker. Um, the fact is that there is now a piece of legislation before this House that would further make changes at Orange and would, would improve the oversight, Mr. Speaker. And so I hope that the members opposite will support us and will uh, work to Member get that from Renfrew, from to order. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Your dogged defense of your Deputy Premier in the face of damning evidence against her tells and turns that you would rather defend one of your own than take responsibility for at least four deaths caused by your government's negligence. Another, government, another document the committee reviewed is a confidential ministry briefing note dated October 27, 2010, detailing the Freedom of Inter Information requests from 2009, both by the Ministry of Health and Management Board of Cabinet. The Freedom of Information asked about Dr. Maz's salary, procurement policies at Orange, and their purchase of speedboats. Premier, are you still prepared to stand by your Deputy Premier's position that she knew nothing of the troubles at Orange in 2010? Mr. Speaker, what I'm standing behind is the, uh, the fact that our government took action led by the Deputy Member Premier in her role then as Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. We took action, Mr. Speaker, and we made Member changes from at Orange. And we put in place a, a piece of legislation that is before the House and actually has been uh, before the House since February 2013 when Bill 11 was first introduced, Mr. Speaker, has been before the House. We hope that the opposition will work with us to get that passed so that, so that increased oversight will be in place for Orange, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that the committee has uh, now uh, got the report. The uh, report has been released, and I understand that it was a Liberal motion that got that report tabled. Yeah. That's a good thing. We're glad that the report is uh, is now available, Mr. Speaker. And as I Answer. say, we want to make sure that there is as much oversight and as stringent oversight as possible. That's why we need the help of the opposition Thank to you. get that legislation passed. Final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, your persistent denials would be comical, but for the fact that your deputy premier's see no evil, hear no evil strategy in orange contributed to the deaths of four orange employees. Your deputy premier either didn't read these documents or she read them and chose to ignore them. Either way, patients in Ontario died because of the negligence of this deputy premier and your government. Premier, I ask you again, how much more proof do you need before you will demand your deputy premier's resignation? You know, Mr. Speaker, I understand when uh, a member is given a, a set of questions to read that there's a huge temptation to just read those questions yes, and not actually think about the answers and not actually think about the issue at hand. Yeah. The fact is we have worked very hard to restore confidence of the people of Ontario in the air ambulance service, Mr. Speaker. This is a very serious issue. I think the member knows full well that we took action when we learned that there were problems at Orange. We took immediate action to change the leadership and we have continued by putting in place a piece of legislation that would further increase the oversight of, uh, of Orange. So I really believe that the member opposite should pay attention to the changes that have been made. The member from Leeds Grenville will withdraw.
Thank you. Should pay attention to the changes that have been made, and if there are substantive issues around the legislation that uh, he's got a comment on, let's hear those as yes, opposed sir. to just a mindless recitation of rhetoric that Order. actually doesn't move the issue forward. Yes. You see it, please. You see it, please. The, uh, the side comments, uh, the side comments we can do without. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Uh, this government's austerity budget shows that almost every ministry will be facing average cuts of 6% this year, next year, and the year after that. Can the Premier tell Ontarians how many people she's planning to fire? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, what's interesting about this question from the leader of the third party is that um, we introduced a budget uh, last May, and we, uh, she then decided that it was time to go to an election. We went to an election. We ran on the budget. Uh, we ran on the budget as a cornerstone of our plan, Mr. Speaker. And so did the leader of the third party. She ran on the same fiscal plan, Mr. Speaker, except she said she was going to find $600 million more in savings, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is we are facing a challenging fiscal situation. We understand that. We also know that we have to make investments in infrastructure, in people's talent and skills. We have to work in partnership with business if our economy is going to grow. So that's the plan we ran on, Mr. Yes, Speaker. That's the plan she ran on, and that's the plan that we're implementing, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, we've uh, sent an FOI to the Treasury Board asking who they plan to cut and what services they plan to cut. Instead of giving an answer, they refuse to provide anything at all, Speaker. So I did ask the Premier a question. I think Ontarians would like to know where she is going to cut. The bottom line is, will this Premier be straight with Ontarians about who it is that's going to be getting a pink slip from this government. So, Mr. Speaker, again, I will just say this is an interesting question from a, no a number of perspectives. So, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party was on at us about our plan to optimize assets, Mr. Speaker, to actually find to find a way to make those assets work for the people of Ontario so that work better for the people of Ontario so that we could make investments in transportation infrastructure that's needed Mr. Speaker across the province. So now today she doesn't want to talk about that because she doesn't want to talk about where there might be money coming in Mr. Speaker in order for us to uh, to make the investments that we need. Today she wants to just isolate one piece of our plan which is yes to transform to transform our services to make sure that we deliver health care in a way that is the most cost effective Answer. and to the best benefit of the people of Ontario. So I think she's trying to have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. It would be good if she looked at the whole plan which she ran on, which Thank we're you. implementing. Well, Speaker, the Premier's fairy tale doesn't wash on this side of the House. She obviously didn't look at the uh, details of our plan, but that's fine. Uh, when it is when it's Thank you. Finish, please. Speaker, whether it's a dad who relies on a speech therapist for his daughter, or a doctor who relies on a highway being plowed so she can go to work, or an employee who relies on inspectors to make sure their workplace is safe, Ontarians rely on public services, Speaker. And all I would like is for the Premier to tell Ontarians to come clean with Ontarians about what services she's going to be cutting. 
Gardner. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just want to uh, I just want to reassure the leader of the third party. I did look at the nine-page plan that nine uh, that they put nine forward, eight. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I looked at it very closely. It didn't take a long time, but I did look at it very closely. <laughs> and what I saw, Mr. Speaker, was a plan that was based on our plan. It was a plan that made all the assumptions that we made about what this economy needed in order to grow, Mr. Speaker, with the exception, for example, of any investment in the Ring of Fire. There was nothing in the, uh, the NDP's plan about Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker. There were huge gaps in terms of how they were going to find, for example, $600 million more million than we said we needed to find, Mr. Speaker. So, the reality is we are confronting a challenging fiscal situation. We have appointed a president yes, of the Treasury Board to make sure that we look across government and we make the changes that are necessary to preserve services and, at the same time, make government work Thank as you. efficiently as possible. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. My next, uh, my next question is also to the Premier, Speaker, and uh, coincidentally, it's about making government work more efficiently. A study by experts at the University of Toronto has shown that P3 projects cost on average 16 per cent more over. than publicly financed projects. But for some reason, the Premier said she was proud that a quarter of Ontarians, Ontario's infrastructure projects were being done with P3s. Now, can the Premier tell Ontarians why she thinks it's it's good to pay 16 per cent more for projects on, uh, on a quarter of our projects, actually, uh, and costing Ontarians more money. So, Mr. Speaker, what I think is good and responsible and absolutely necessary is that government work with the private sector, that we find a way for those kinds of partnerships to bring benefit to the people of Ontario. And the fact is that you look across the globe right now and there is no jurisdiction that is not struggling with how to build infrastructure, including, including China, where uh, there is a, a, a really important move to find Order. ways to cooperate with the private sector in order order to get the amount of infrastructure built that they know that they need. So, yes, Mr. Speaker, we're working with the private sector, and because we're working with the private sector, we have dozens of projects across this province that are being built that would not be built otherwise. Thank you. Well, Speaker, yesterday the Premier spoke to the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships to pat them on the back and promise to hand them more money. That same study that I just mentioned, Speaker, caught the attention of media and one reporter. Minister of Economic Speaker, Development, come to order. One reporter who said, and I quote, "P3s become vehicles for governments to subsidize inflated profits of powerful and well-connected contractors and financial institutions." Wow. End quote. So. When the Premier was telling the P3 Association just how much she loved P3s, can she tell us whose profits she was actually including? So, Mr. Speaker, let's look at what the alternative financing and procurement model has accomplished here in Ontario. Infrastructure Ontario is currently managing over 80 major AFP infrastructure projects, 37 of which have uh, reached the end of construction. Of these 37 projects, 36 or 97 per cent were completed under budget. Mr. Speaker. So, 27 of them were completed on time, and AFP projects, as the, as the member has said, represent approximately 25 per cent of capital investments in the year 2014-2015. So the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that there are roads and bridges and transit projects that are being built across this province, in Ottawa, in Kitchener-Waterloo, in, uh, in all parts of the province, that would not be being yes, built if it were not for the partnership with the private sector. And the fact is, we have no ideological bent that says we cannot work with the private sector as they do, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, when the government signs P3s, they're helping out powerful and well-connected contractors and financial institutions. That's the fact. Our own Auditor General has said the exact same thing, Speaker. And yesterday, the Premier visited those contractors and financial institutions to tell them what a great job they were doing in charging Ontarians more for something the government can do itself for 16 per cent cheaper. 
New Democrats asked the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure to table any evidence, any evidence at all, that P3s made any financial sense, and we got nothing, Speaker, nothing back. Now, does the Premier have any evidence at all to justify paying these well-connected contractors and financial institutions a 16 per cent bonus Question. for something that we can do ourselves? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think, what, you know, I think what's really important is that um, the people of Ontario understand that what the leader of the third party is asking is whether we will put the brakes on projects like the mental health facility that is being built uh, at St. Joe's in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker, that those projects that are benefiting people in all parts of this province, that we will put the brakes on those. And the answer is no, Mr. Speaker. We will not put the brakes on those. We will continue to make responsible investment, and we are investing billions of dollars as government of public money into these projects, Mr. Speaker. And yes, we are working with the private sector, who is taking risks, Mr. Speaker, and delivering these projects on time and on budget. So will we stop that? No, we will not. We know that this building is needed for the economic growth of this province and the well-being of the people of Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> New question. The member from Halliburton, Fort Hamilton, Toronto. Premier, I stand again today to ask you to strike the all-party committee's select committee to study sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, we owe it to the victims of sexual harassment to have this discussion. Uh, they need us to better understand the challenges victims face in determining when and how to come forward after an incident and how institutions can better support and protect victims from further harm. So, Premier, will you support this important dialogue by allowing all three parties in the legislature to work together on a select committee on sexual Minister of Labour is going to want to uh, comment on the supplementary, but I just want to let the member opposite know what I have done in the last 24 hours. Um, so, and I also know that the select committee issue is going to be discussed by House leaders. They're going to have that conversation. But um, I want the leader of the, or I want the uh, member of the uh, opposition to know that. Um, I've had a conversation with the head of the Ontario Public Service, um, and he has already informed me that a comprehensive review is happening of the OPS policies on discrimination and harassment and violence. That, that review is happening, and it's very, it's very important, I think, that we understand that that kind of review is critical, that the kind of training that needs to happen on an annual basis is happening within the OPS, within the broader public service, and quite frankly, within our own, uh, within our, in our own legislative world. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we need to make sure that all of that is in place, and so I will continue to Answer. do what is necessary. The discussion around uh, what further we may do uh, will take place at the House Leaders' meeting. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I appreciate the Premier's comments, um, and we have the workplace uh, discrimination, harassment, prevention policy here was given to us, but. All of that is well and good, but if the victims are not coming forward or the policies are being ignored, uh, we owe it to the victims to listen and to do better. Uh, I bring up the case again of the Assistant Crown Attorney being given a golden handshake of $180,000 uh, by the government. Uh, the women were never heard. Uh, clearly, someone in the government had to sign off on that and did not follow these policies. Um, so, uh, you know. The conversation, yeah, the conversation does need to happen. That's why we asked for the select committee. The work does need to be done. Uh, it's not just uh, here at the, at the at public service. We've seen it in the CBC, uh, but we've also seen it from brave people like former Toronto Star reporter Antonio Zerbesius, who said she'd been raped more than once but never came forward, has started a worldwide discussion through the social media hashtag, uh, been raped, never reported. So again, Premier, uh, we owe it uh, as a government to be a good force for Thank you. Uh, in people's lives and allow the all parties. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Stop the clock, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you, Speaker. And let me thank uh, the, uh, the member officer for what is a very, very important question that we all have a role to play in ensuring that violence and harassment in Ontario workplaces is simply not tolerated. It's something we will not put up with. Everybody in this province, regardless of their gender, should be able to work in a safe and a healthy workplace. Our government was the very first government in Ontario, this House, in 2009 passed Bill 168. What it does is it very specifically requires employment, uh, employers in this province to have plans in place 
to prevent this from happening in the workplace and to deal with it as it happens in the workplace. What, em what employees need to know, what men and women in this province need to know, that if they are suffering or they feel they are suffering violence or, or harassment in the workplace, they have the right to refuse that work. You stop right now. If you yes, think sir. you're in imminent danger, you contact the police. If you think it's an ongoing issue you can't solve, you contact us. Order, please. Okay. No question. The member from James My question is to the Premier. Premier, you profess to be a progressive politician. You profess to say that you want to govern in a way that's open and transparent to the people of Ontario. But when we look at your record so far in the major this majority, you're doing exactly what Dalton McGuinty did, and you're time allocating everything oh, under worse. the sun. Worse. So I'm asking you, as, as a fellow member of this assembly, why is it that you're choosing not to allow the public to have their say on these very important bills such as daycare? and not allowing the committees to be able to travel outside of Toronto to hear what they have to say about this very important issue. Why are you like Dalton McGuinty, and why don't you stop time allocating? Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the, the member, uh, member from the third party for, for the question. Uh, Speaker, I, uh, I think all members recognize in the House that we received a very strong man mandate from the people of Ontario on June the 12th. They have asked us I'm trying to hear. Please. Speaker, the, the Ontarians have asked us to, to move forward with a progressive agenda that was put forward uh, in, in a budget that, uh, that was passed in, in this House in a, in, a, in a platform that really clearly speaks, uh, spoke to the priorities of Ontario, and, and they really have asked us to make sure that we stop uh, having uh, stalling tactics and gamemanship that goes on in this House and pass important pieces of legis legislation uh, that will make Ontarians' life uh, better, and that's why, Speaker, uh, we're making sure that those priority uh, bills that were uh, were not passed in the previous parliament are passed in this session as quickly as Thank possible. Well, Premier, I would prefer that you answer the question because you stood through the last election, you said you were progressive, you said you were going to govern different, and you said you were going to engage the public in the decisions that face this legislature. How can you say that at the same time not allowing people outside of the city to have their say on very important bills? So I'll ask you the question again. Member from Why Maine's is it that you're time allocating order. at a time where the opposition is not even holding up the legislation? We've said to your House Leader, we have no interest in slowing this down. All we want to do is to give the, give the public an opportunity to have their say. So this opposition, nor the Conservatives, are holding it up. Why are you shutting down the public's ability to have their say? Speaker, we are moving ahead with the progressive agenda of this government. Speaker, we are moving ahead with bills like uh, Bill 8, uh, enhancing transparency for public sector and MPPs. We, move, we are moving ahead with, with a bill that ensures that we have fair minimum wage in our province. We are moving ahead with a bill, Speaker, that ensures that uh, uh, we modernize our child care so that our children are protected when parents drop them off at, at the child care. And, Speaker, we are doing so in a responsible way. Let's just take Bill 10 as an example, the Child Care Modernization Act. There will be hearings, Speaker, that will take place. There will be two days of hearings that will take place, and they will both go late in the evening so that parents and child care pro uh, providers can have access yes, uh, uh, to, uh, to those hearings, and they are heard. But in the end of the day, Speaker, our number one priority is the well-being of Ontarians, especially our Thank children. You. Thank you. New, new question. The member from Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Finance. Minister, I hear from my constituents in Burlington and from people across our province that growing the economy and job creation is their top priority. They are encouraged that Ontario's economy is growing faster than the national economy, and they feel secure that our path to balance is as responsible as it is compassionate. But people continue to read stories, and they are concerned about the lasting effects of the global economic recession. As the world becomes increasingly globalized and new markets continue to emerge, the people of Ontario want to know how our province plans to compete with economies around the world. Minister, can you please update this House on the steps the government is taking to compete with those emerging economies and how you plan to ensure that Ontario's economy continues to grow despite the challenging global economic environment? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the wonderful member from Burlington for her question. 
Ontario is indeed operating in a competitive and challenging global environment. And so, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank and take this opportunity to congratulate the Premier, the Minister of Economic Development and Employment and Infrastructure, as well as the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade for the successful, successful trade mission to China. Already, this mission has attracted nearly $1 billion to Ontario wow. in new deals, and it's creating more than 1,800 new jobs. Wow. Our government understands the importance of Ontario being recognized as globally innovative as a jurisdiction, and this successful trade mission is just part of our plan to grow our economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, it's great to hear that our government is continuously working to attract new jobs and investments on behalf of the people of Ontario. It is clear that Ontario is emerging from the global recession with strong fundamentals, which will ensure we can continue to provide the programs and services that Ontarians expect and rely on. As we reflect back on the accomplishments of the government and plan for the future, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about our efforts our government is making here at home to grow our economy and eliminate the deficit? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fires. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Burlington. Our purpose is clear, Mr. Speaker. It's to create opportunity and security for people, to build Ontario up well, at the same time eliminating the deficit in a responsible and balanced way. Our prudent path to balance is working. However, global uncertainty still remains, and that's why we have a four-point plan for stimulating the economy, yeah. including maintaining a competitive tax environment that encourages business to invest and grow, building strategic partnerships with business to stimulate innovation and productivity, moving forward with the government's going global trade strategy to tap into emerging markets like China, and helping businesses manage electricity and other costs to ensure our prosperity and competitiveness. And Mr. Speaker, in fact, I look forward to updating the House further on our progress and our broader economic plan on November 17th, when I table the fall economic statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Perry South, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, yesterday the town of Fort Francis and area First Nations chartered a plane at great expense to fly 1,800 kilometres to Toronto to try to get your government's attention. The paper mill is shut down, and if they don't get some help soon, in a matter of weeks, it could be lost forever. Xperia, a specialty paper company, was interested in reopening the plant but they could not get a reasonably priced supply of wood fiber essential to make the project viable. That price is controlled by the past owners of the mill. Premier, Xperia was willing to invest $100 million to create hundreds of jobs in northwestern Ontario. So my question, will you call the CEO of Xperia and do what you can to close a deal that will question. create jobs and bring investment opportunities to Fort France. Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. For Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. And I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question. Um, I would start by saying that the community of Fort Francis flew to Toronto uh, with their supportive team uh, for good reason, but I would say to the member they didn't have to fly to Toronto to get our attention because they've had their attention on this issue going back weeks ago uh, when the deal fell apart they had our attention and since the deal fell apart they've continued to have our attention. I mentioned yesterday in response to several questions we will continue to work as closely with we, as we can with the community of Fort Francis and with both of the parties to see what is possible. The member knows at the end of the day that this was a B2B arrangement that was trying to be consummated between hopefully a willing seller and hopefully a willing buyer. To this point, the deal has not been consummated. We continue to be Answer. in contact with them and work as diligently as we can to see what is possible to try and breathe some life back into that deal. Hey, here. Thank you. And, and again, to the Premier, I don't think the Premier heard the question there, and that was that the ask for her to make a phone call to the CEO of Xperia, so I, I hope she will do that, though she passed the question on. Premier, the sustain, sustainable forest license in the Fort Francis area is controlled by the past operator of the paper mill. They're no longer interested in running the mill, but continue to control the Crown Forest, the cross-root forest. Premier, don't you think the license to harvest wood, or at a minimum, an economic supply of fiber from nearby forests should go to the company willing to locate operations and reopen the mill in Fort Francis. Thank you, Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. To, to the member's point, um, and I said this in response to the similar questions yesterday, last week when the deal fell apart, I did reach out to the CEO of Expera and I talked to him last week. I talked to the CEO of Expera again just this morning. We are still working within our ministry, within government, to see exactly what is possible, if anything. I had a good conversation with him this morning. There were no commitments made from him back to me or from me back to him. Only for him to be aware that as a government and as a ministry, we are still very interested in seeing something positive for Fort Francis. The member should also know that it is not with a stroke of a pen that an ESFL is created. And in fact, if we were to do it that way, there would obviously be impacts for the current flow of that wood fiber to other operations in the province of Ontario. I would think that the member knows that. And as a result of that, Speaker, his suggestion would be that we wouldn't be consulting with First Nations or with the community or with industry on what that ESFL should look like. That work would not have guaranteed anything. We're willing to look at all options to breathe life back into this Thank deal, you. and we continue to do that, Speaker. Thank you. Question the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for Pan Parapan Games. Uh, speaker, the minister needs now to take responsibility for the missed deadlines, the mushrooming budgets of the 2015 Pan Parapan Games. I've asked him about the, few, the first few games of the Tiger Cats season that had to be relocated because the Hamilton Stadium was not done when the government said it would be, and it is still, I repeat, still not done. And now a significant soccer match that would have acted as a test run for the Hamilton Stadium Pan Am readiness had to be moved to McMaster. The minister, as is the Liberal way, didn't answer these questions and never has, and now the city of Hamilton, openly concerned that the latest completion date won't be met, and a member of the local Pan Parapan Committee doesn't think the completion date will be met. Speaker, does this minister think that the Question. people of this province finally deserve an honest and full answer about the ongoing delays to significant Pan Parapan Games venues and the costs? Thank you. The Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport, and Minister responsible for the 2015 Pan Parapan uh, uh, Games. A long title. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member was here in the legislature, I believe, on Monday when I answered the exact same question in regards to uh, the Hamilton Stadium. He knows uh, fully well that this is a $146 million investment into the, into the city of Hamilton. The people of Hamilton are quite excited with, uh, with this venue. The Hamilton Tiger Cats are, are undefeated in the stadium. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in fact, Mr. Speaker, if you talk to the people of Hamilton, you'll realize that that region alone has brought in the most volunteers out of all of Ontario. So they're buying into the games. They've bought into the fact that they're going to have a brand new stadium, and he knows fully where it's, there's not going to be. Uh, excuse me. The bantering back and forth has got to stop. And the, the member knows, Mr. Speaker, that this is the largest investment the from in infrastructure here in the province of Ontario when it comes to our sport facilities, probably in the history of this province. History. And we're going to go from a jurisdiction that was doing pretty well to exceptionally well, not only here in North yes, America, sir. not only here in Canada, but throughout North America. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. Thanks for the travel log again. Speaker, the people of Hamilton, the people of Milton, where the cycling velodrome is also not ready and where they also missed a staging test event, deserve better than a smiling, happy minister who says everything's great. No answers coming from the other side, as usual. We're not, get ta we're not talking about a peewee hockey game here, Minister. We're talking about a $260 million and rising multi-site international games for the people of Ontario who could be on the hook for a lot more. Speaker, the minister's reputation is also on the hook. Will he take responsibility for the mess, end the rhetoric, the take the lead with his cabinet colleagues, make sure that these venues are going to be ready on time and on budget, which I don't think they will be. In fact, I know they won't be. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, we've had three technical briefings on the issue in regards to Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games. We've gone through the venues, we've gone through the costs, and I don't think the member opposite has showed up to any of those briefings. Number one. Number two, Mr. Speaker. Number two, Mr. Speaker. If you look at the actual infrastructure projects that we have uh, in operation on turn in regards to the Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games, the Scarborough Aquatic Centre, which is fully op operational, if you go in there, it's a big hub of activity. It's 43.8 
million dollars under budget. Number one. Number two, the Pan Am Para Pan Am Field, two point nine million dollars under budget. The Markham Pan Am and Para Pan Am Centre, seven point three. Uh, let's not talk. <laughs> the uh, member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Wrap up, please. So the simple fact is, Mr. Speaker, we, this government has made the largest investment into athletic infrastructure in the history of this province. We're proud of our records. We're doing this not only for the athletes Thanks, here sir. today, but the athletes in the future, and we're very proud of our record. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for women's issues. Uh, minister, the Premier has just noted that sexual harassment will not be tolerated in Ontario, and that we must remain vigilant when it comes to addressing this very serious issue. She told us that whether it's at work or whether it's at home, that women in Ontario have a right to feel safe. I know that this government is committed to taking action and working collectively as we move forward. Minister, can you please share with us what steps your ministry has taken to uh, ensure that we are safe? Thank you, Minister for Children and Youth Services and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member for Kitchener Centre for this very important and serious question. As we know, the Premier has taken a very active role on this issue. And in fact, I want to share with the House that later this evening, the Premier will be delivering opening remarks at the official opening of the He for She campaign. This is a movement of over 119,000 men across the world, Speaker, who've committed to take a stand for gender equality, and over 12,200 people in Canada have done the very same thing. I would strongly encourage everyone in this legislature to join this movement. Initiatives like He for She are critical because they raise awareness on this issue. Mon ministère a pris des actions concrètes. And the government wants to support concrete actions about uh, sexual harassment. Dollars uh, over a four-year plan and three million dollars for sexual assault centers in our province. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. It's very encouraging to hear about a campaign like He for She. And I think I speak for the entire caucus when I say that we are very proud of the Premier for taking action on this very serious matter. Just last week, I had a meeting with some stakeholders at the Waterloo Region Sexual Assault Centre, and most of the conversation was about events at the CBC, and I tell you, as a former broadcaster, I get it, having witnessed and experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. Minister, can you please tell us what other policies are in place in the workplace to ensure that we all feel safe at work? Thank you. Minister? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that very, very important question. As I said in response to a previous question, we simply do not tolerate violence and harassment in Ontario's workplaces. It's that clear. Everybody in this province should be able to work in a workplace that is both safe and healthy. To answer the question specifically, what we did in 2009 as a government is we made amendments to the Occupational Health and Safety Act in Bill 168. What that said is that all employers in this province have to have workplace violence and workplace harassment policies in place, and they also have to have programs that implement those policies in a serious way, Speaker. There's a variety of information that we can provide from the Ministry of Labour. If there's any employer out there that's watching today that wants to do better, that thinks he or she wants to review those policies, and we also Answer. give the right to refuse work. Anybody that feels that they're under duress in this regard should simply refuse to do the job, contact the police, or contact us. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Speaker, my question is to the uh, Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister Shane uh, Burt is a 21-year-old man with spastic quadriplegia cerebral palsy, who, due to his age, has been told he is no longer allowed to attend school. In a matter of months, he has gone from having access to a walker, a stander, a bike, lifts, an exercise table, and an integrated computer system allowing him to communicate in a school setting, to having none of those things now. His family explains that no programming exists for his type of disability in the entire region outside of a school setting. Minister, the All-Party Select Committee on Developmental Services released its final report in July, the 46th recommendation 
was for the Interministerial Committee to work with families and community agencies to develop more day programming tailored to a wider range of needs. Question. Will you commit to provide day programming to meet the needs of Shane Burke? Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, certainly, I cannot uh, comment on any specific case, uh, uh, but I can say in general that uh, uh, we on this side of the House took the Select Committee's report extremely seriously. I did uh, uh, say in my ministerial statement uh, in some detail uh, that we were looking at very closely at all 46 uh, recommendations in that report report and uh, certainly will be taking the advice very, very seriously. Uh, in terms of uh, individuals transitioning specifically from one uh, situation, an educational set, uh, uh, situation in particular and moving through to adulthood, uh, this is an area that uh, I've asked my parliamentary assistant uh, to focus on in terms of ensuring that these types of Answer. transitions uh, are as smooth as possible, that a plan is in place as an uh, earlier date, uh, earliest date possible. Thank Here, you. Well, Minister, again to the Minister, the Bird family uh, explains that no programming is available in our area, and we have been in contact with your ministry, but I'd be happy to provide you with Shane's uh, particulars again. As the family describes, Shane is like a six-month-old baby that understands everything. He can't walk, he can't talk, but when the proper programming is in place, he thrives. At school, he learned to float and roll over in a pool by himself. He helped serve food and dusted furniture at the local brick store with his classmates. He had daily exercise and interaction with his peers. The Burts want Shane back in school until programming in the community is available, and I don't think that's an unreasonable suggestion. In fact, a regulation under Section 16 of the Education Act states, quote, the committee may recommend that an exceptional pupil who is 21 years of age or older remain in a secondary school program. Question. Quote, so my question is simple. Will you undertake to ensure that everything is done to see if Shane can't stay in the secondary program that he was thriving in? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, this is precisely the type of situation that caused us to invest some $810 million over three years, yeah, yeah. particularly yeah. into the sector. And I do recall that uh, the two opposition parties uh, voted against that budget, which is most unfortunate. I do want to reassure the member opposite that uh, in September 2014, my ministry, the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and the Ministry of Education implemented integrated transition planning for young people uh, with developmental disabilities who are preparing for adulthood. Uh, so I want to certainly uh, be very, I'm very open to hearing more about this particular case, uh, but this is precisely the work that we are committed to doing, and uh, we took the good advice of the select committee Answer. in this regard, and uh, we will be moving forward. Thank you very much, Thank you uh, to the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, I believe first and foremost that forests in Rainy River District should serve to create jobs in the Rainy River District, as it has for the better part of 100 years. Now the people in this town are left watching as their livelihood is being trucked away. I believe that the Cross Route Forest should pr be providing fiber to the local Fort Francis Mill so that we can create 1,000 jobs so that 1,000 people can pay their bills. But the minister seems content with the status quo. My question is, Minister, is the reason why you're refusing to resolve this situation in Fort Francis because the wood is going to your riding to be processed instead of I'm, uh, I'm going to ask for order, and then I'm going to make an observation that uh, we have to be very careful in the House when we make comments that uh, are coming close, and I'll only offer a warning uh, that uh, impugning motive is not what we do in this place. Uh, Minister, uh, the, the member from NAP and Carleton uh, will come to order. It doesn't matter if you're looking at me or not, <laughs> and that includes anyone that wants to add anything else.
Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you. Uh, you know, a week ago I asked my staff. I asked my staff a week ago, who do you think will ask this question? I predicted it would be the NDP, and so I was right. Speaker, this kind of question is so predictable from that particular party, and I will demonstrate to you by way of example for the member opposite why she is so misplaced. In um, stop the clock. The uh, start the clock. Order. Uh, I'm still standing. Come to order. And the Minister of Agriculture come to order as well. Carry on. Speaker, in 2011, three months before the provincial election, a mill in my riding in Atacokan called the Sapawi Mill that was owned by Buchanan had 640,000 cubic meters of wood attached to it. And three months before a provincial election, our government took that wood away from the mill in my riding. And very shortly after that, that mill was torn down. And do you know where that wood went? It went to Fort Francis, the Resolute Mill that was owned in Fort Francis. And how did you feel? How did you feel about the mill at that time? Were you standing up and throwing... The uh, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will withdraw. Order. At this time, I will also remind you once again, in this place, we raise the level of debate. Supplementary. I will tell the minister who the NDP is. We are the party in this parliament who are standing up for the people of this province. It is your government that's making this mess. The people of Port Francis are keen to work, and they are feeling angry, and they are feeling betrayed by your government's unwillingness to act. 1,000 jobs will have a major impact on our community. Sustainably managing the cross-route forest in order to create jobs at the Fort Francis Mill would bring stability and prosperity back to the Northwest. In fact, in 2011, New Democrats proposed changes to the wood tenure system that would ensure that when a mill closes its doors, that the wood allocations would revert back to the local community. Right now, the minister seems content with the status quo that is only benefiting his community, the community that he represents. Instead of listening to the priorities of the people who question. live in the area where the wood is being harvested, my question to the minister is, does this sound like good, solid, sound governmental policy? Thank you. No, no, no. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Speaker, you know, this particular member was so concerned about the Fort Francis Mill that never once since it's been closed for the last two years or so has she written to this minister or this ministry in regard to the closure of that mill. That's how concerned she's been about that particular mill. Speaker, at the core of this is the tenure modernization piece. We introduced it in 2011. The members opposite in both parties apparently want you to think that if an ESFL process was in place for this mill, and if that process had started a year ago, it would not have been concluded by now, in all likelihood. Order. Even if it had been, as I've said before, it's only one component of the deal that was required, hopefully between a willing seller and between a potential buyer. It was only one phase. There were other components of the deal that were on the table that were being negotiated between the two parties. This was only one part of it. And as I've said repeatedly and will say again, even if the ESFL Answer. had been in place, it would not have guaranteed any deal. We continue to work with both parties and with the community to see what we can do. Thank you. Next question. The member from uh, Brampton, Springdale. Speaker, 
Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. In my riding of Brampton Springdale, one of the most frequent things I hear about is the constituents and their experiences at Service Ontario locations. My constituents depend on Service Ontario for many important services, such as license plate sticker renewals, health card and driver's license renewals, and obtaining birth certificates. Service Ontario is just an import, just important to my, not just important to my constituents, to, but to all Ontarians. The service that they provide are essential and important to Ontarians that they have proper documentation to see a doctor or to register their business. However, I've had constituents comment on the occasional longer than normal wait times. My constituents understand that delays are a part of life and that they do happen. They want to know what can be done to try to minimize these instances. Can the minister please update the House on what his ministry is doing to alleviate wait times at Service Ontario locations, not only in my Next riding, question. but across the province? Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague from uh, Brampton Springdale for the question. She's raised a very important issue in her riding. Low wait times are one of the keys to customer satisfaction, and we have many initiatives to shorten wait times that we're proud of. In 2013, the average customer wait time at Service Ontario centres was roughly nine minutes. And of our over 280 Service Ontario locations, 97% of them had a wait time of less than 15 minutes. Recognizing that Service Ontario Centre in Brampton has an above average wait time, we recently launched a pilot project aimed at helping to improve the wait times in Brampton. Part of the strategy involved informing the public of the necessary documentation needed, as well as hide it, highlighting the option to use various online services for renewal functions. We have moved over 40 of our services offered at Service Ontario to online services, making transactions easily accessible. Yes, this past year, we made it possible uh -huh. to renew your driver's license online, a first of its kind in Canada. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. My thanks for the minister for his response and for informing myself in the House of the important steps that the ministry has taken. These are all great initiatives towards reducing wait times at Service Ontario, both in my riding and across the province. Speaker, there have been many other steps taken by Service Ontario to ensure that wait times remain reasonable. As the minister said, many services are now offered online, and some of them for the first time in Canada. These online services not only decrease wait times, but increase the convenience of renewing documents for Ontarians. Would the minister please update the House on what other Service Ontario services services are offered online and the benefits of completing transactions online. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, and again, uh, thanks to the member from Brampton Springdale for the question. By offering more services online, Service Ontario is ensuring that Ontarians can access the services they need when they need them. One of the options is certainly the 15-day money-back guarantee when you order your birth certificate online. We also have a four-in-one bundle available where parents can apply for a birth certificate, a social insurance number, and both federal and provincial child tax benefit credits in one easy transaction. This year, we're encouraging people to renew their license plate stickers online. This will decrease wait times not only at the Brampton Service Ontario location, but at Service Ontario locations across Ontario. Another important service is One Source for Business, an online service portal that provides businesses with a single window to view and manage their relationship with different levels of government. At Service Ontario's speaker, we are focused on innovation and customer service excellence so that Ontarians will spend less time standing in line, more time online. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, during a Liberal fundraiser in Stratford in November of last year, before the last election, you were asked about GO train service to Stratford. You were quoted as saying, full day, two-way GO service is a priority, and expanding GO service is a priority. I then asked you to clarify your plans for GO transit in Perth Wellington. It's now a year later, and you still haven't answered. I've twice written to the Minister of Transportation, and he still hasn't answered. I asked the Premier, can we conclude from your silence that you were just telling people what they wanted to hear before an election? No, she wouldn't do it. No. Minister, Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for that question. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, a number of weeks ago, a number of months ago, actually, Speaker, while at the AMO conference to have a face-to-face -face conversation with the mayor from the community that he referenced, the mayor of Stratford. Uh, it was a great conversation. As I've spoken to many mayors and council members and others from communities right across the province of Ontario, Speaker, there is exceptional excitement, as there should be, about our government's very ambitious plan to invest significantly in transit and transportation infrastructure over the next decade. I look forward to having continued dialogue and conversations with the mayor of Stratford, 
and mayors and regional chairs from <coughs> communities in York Region, in Durham, in Peel, in Toronto, in Niagara, and elsewhere, Speaker, uh, while Metrolinx and the Ministry of Transportation continues to do its work because all of our decisions going forward as to where we and how we invest that money, I mentioned a second ago, Speaker, will be based on business case analysis Answer. and evidence so that we can provide positive results for communities right across the region Thank and the you. province. Thanks, Speaker. Speaker, that was an interesting answer. Um, Speaker, it looks like the government is leaving out even the possibility that GO trains could serve Stratford in the future. It sounds like the minister isn't giving us something, even, isn't even giving us something aspirational in nature. I wrote to the Premier in November of 2013. She sent my letter to the Minister of Transportation. On April 15th of this year, after months of silence, I wrote to the minister's predecessor. I wrote again to this minister on September 23rd. My letters remain unanswered. Speaker, the government's silence is deafening. When will this government start planning for the future and acknowledge the need for future GO service expansion to Stratford? And, Speaker, when will it start answering its mail? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have to admit to the legislature, Speaker, I find this truly fascinating. Not only the question that I hear from this member today, but the questions that were raised last week while I was at Estimates Committee from some of his colleagues. Since my time in this legislature, since first being elected in 2012, Speaker, at every instance, I've heard nothing from members of that particular caucus and party about anything with respect to building Ontario up, anything with respect, Speaker, to making more investments in crucial infrastructure. What I've heard, Speaker, time and time again, is about their fascination with the need to slash and burn at every turn. And yet, while at Estimates Committee last week, while I stand in my place at this moment, while I did last week as well, whether we're talking about that community or others, I hear repeatedly about their somewhat belated desire to support our plans to invest in crucial infrastructure. It's peculiar to yes, me that I hear this repeatedly. What I can tell that member is that over the next decade, this government, under the leadership of this premier, will invest $29 billion, up to $15 billion for the GTHA, up to $14 billion for the rest of Ontario, to deliver. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Yesterday, media and ministerial staff were invited to tour the Windsor Jail in my riding, yet I was explicitly denied access. Shame. It's ironic a government toting transparency denies elected officials access, access to government facilities. Perhaps the minister didn't want me to point out that, like the old jail, our new Southwest Detention Centre is overcrowded and understaffed. Offenders making up 80 per cent of the maximum capacity are crammed into 60 per cent of the facility's space. Also, Windsor's male intermittent offenders are being shipped to London. While the minister thinks his misstatements of on file is limited to only four to six male intermittent offenders, I want to remind him that the problems in our correctional system impact correctional officers, staff, Question. families, and the general public. When will the minister be proactive, not reactive, when addressing the problems of our correctional system? Thank you, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. And first of all, I want to thank the member for, uh, for yesterday for reaching out to me to get me more, to get more information about about the Windsor Jail and the tours that we are we are hosting as we open the Southwest Detention Center. I want the member to know this, and I'm sure she's received an invite that on Friday, November the 14th, she's getting a VIP tour to the jail along with the judiciary, the mayor. The council members, area MPPs, MPs, the police chief, the fire chief, and the former superintendent. So I hope she will be able to attend a special tour that has already been planned along with all the elected representatives on Friday, November the 14th. Speaker, I am very excited with the, with the challenge uh, and the mandate that the Premier has given to me, and that is to transform our correctional system. Uh, and Speaker, I look forward to working with all members yes, of the House and get their ideas as to how do we have a, uh, a correctional system that is, focuses on rehabilitation uh, of our inmates. The member from Front, uh, Lanark, Lanark, Frontenac, and Lennings and Addington. Thank you. Uh, speaker, on a point of order. Point of order. Um, 
Earlier during question period, uh, you ruled uh, to dispense my, my notice of uh, privilege, um, and you made reference to Standing Order 121 that it first must be raised in committee. If I may, Speaker, um, I did. I attempted to raise this matter in committee on Monday evening. However, the chair refused to consider the matter due to the time allocation. Uh, uh, I've, I've made my ruling, and that's the end of it. And, and in terms of anything else, you need to bring that back to committee. The point of order from the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. I just want to clarify the record that uh, the minister claimed that I didn't attend any, and I did. He came. That's not a point of order. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to the amendment to the motion of allocation of time on Bill 10. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, take your seats, please. On November 4th, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number seven. Mr. Bisson then moved the motion to be amended by deleting all the words after the second paragraph and submitting the following, that the committee shall travel up to five days outside of Toronto for the purpose of public hearings as determined by the committee. Ms. McLeod then moved that the amendment be amended as follows, that the number five be deleted and replaced with the number seven, and that the words as determined by the committee be deleted and replaced with in the following locations, Hamilton, Guelph, Ottawa, Kitchener, London, Windsor, and Sudbury. All those in favour of the amendment to the amendment by Ms. Ms. McLeod will rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Miller Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. Shame. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandler. Ms. Sandler. Mr. Dugo. Mr. Dugo. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Manga. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Jassa. Mr. Jassa. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dom. Mr. Dom. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milton. Mr. Milton. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. The ayes being 44 and the nays being 56, I declare the, the amendment to the amendment lost. Is the House ready to vote on the amendment by Mr. Bisson? Mr. Bisson, 
has moved that the motion be amended by de deleting all of the words after the second paragraph and substituting the follow following that the committee shall travel up to five days outside of Toronto for the purpose of public hearings as determined by the committee. Um, is it the pleasure of the House that the amendment carry? Yes. I heard a no. All those in favour, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say nay. nay. In my opinion, the nays have it. Call in the members. Same this vote. is a five-minute bell. Same vote. Same vote. I have to wait until all are seated. All those in favour of the amendment to the motion will rise one at a time. You'd be recognized by the clerk. We should be song. You should be song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Van Tal. Mr. Van Tal. Madame Jolino. Madame Jolino. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Uh, Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Europe. Mr. Europe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. <laughs> All those opposed to, to the amendment to the motion will rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. 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 Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. The ayes being 44 and the nays being 56, I declare the amendment lost. Is the House ready for the vote on the main motion? Mr. Bradley has moved government notice of motion number seven for the allocation of time on on Bill 10, an act to enact the Child Care and Early Years Act 
2014 to repeal the Day Nurseries Act and to amend the Early Childhood Educators Act 2007, the Education Act and the Ministry of Training, College and Universities Act, and to make consequential and related amendments to other acts. Is it the pleasure of House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. No. I believe the ayes have it. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill. All those in favour of the motion will rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Gardinetti. Mr. Gardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Balkison, Ms. Albanese, Mr. Dixon, Ms. Manga, Mr. Crack, Ms. Wong, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Sergio, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Del Duca, Ms. Domerla, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McMahon, Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. <coughs> All those opposed, please stand one at a time and be recognized by the court. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Madame Gelinard. Madame Gelinard. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishu. 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 Mr.